Greetings, faithful viewers. Thanks for joining me for this episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. Dear Pastor, I've been struggling with my faith and my resting in Jesus after discovering the writings of the Church Fathers. Saints like John Chrysostom, I think it's his homilies on Romans, uh, portrays a life of Christianity that is incredibly hardcore, beyond what I've seen anyone perform, whether it be Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox. Not only does Chrysostom describe the salvation of mankind in such a way that is almost verbatim with what Roman Catholicism teaches, but without words like original sin, uh, but he then burdens the Christian with living up to the standard of the apostles in the book of Acts. If I recall correctly, he even says something like, if you store money to buy furniture, but see the poor and do not feed them, uh, you are not even Christian. Even the apostles sold all they had and gave from the abundance of those in need. That's a rough paraphrase of several paragraphs. This, I think, shows that Chrysostom has either ruined my confidence and that his writings have had a lot of sway in my heart, even though I haven't gone deeper into how much of him I've read. Uh, he really is the best example of how harsh the early church writings can be. All of this being said is kind of a basis for my ultimate question. How can I truly and genuinely trust that this man who has the Holy Spirit would have less significance and authority than the Old Testament prophets uh, who would have had also had the Holy Spirit? If Christians have the Holy Spirit, then why is it that we can't be fallible, we can't be infallible, excuse me, but the apostles and the Old Testament prophets can be? All right, so let's deal with the second question first about uh, the Holy Spirit and infallibility, because once we understand that, the uh, stuff about Chrysostom will fall into place pretty easily, uh, or in any of the church fathers for that matter. So there's a difference between having the Holy Spirit and uh, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So all Christians possess the Holy Spirit by virtue of their baptism. St. Paul writes in Corinthians, uh, for 2 Corinthians 1.22 that God has given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Uh, so he's the seal of God's promise, uh, as he says in uh, Ephesians 1.14, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts, uh, according to 2 Timothy 1.14. He also then makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, when we don't know the things for which we ought to pray, as Paul says in Romans 8, 26. Paul also says in Galatians 5, then, that the Spirit fights against our sinful flesh's desires so that they don't rule and reign over us and lead us into impenitence and sin. And so these are the reasons that the Holy Spirit is given to us in baptism and through the Word. Now, so that's what it means to have the Holy Spirit. It's quite another thing to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. The main passages for this to consider first is 2 Peter 1, uh, 20 through 21. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for privacy never came, uh, excuse me, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is why St. Paul can tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so from these passages, we see that the prophets and the writers of Scripture were divinely inspired or moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of God himself. The big difference between these two ideas, that of having the Holy Spirit and being inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that the Scripture promises the first, having the Holy Spirit, to all Christians. But he doesn't promise divine inspiration to all Christians. So all Christians have the Holy Spirit uh, as a guarantee of their salvation interceding for them and fighting, you know, cooperating with them in the fight of the sinful flesh, strengthening them. But nowhere does the scripture say that the, that, uh, that the means, the Holy, that means the Holy Spirit inspires all Christians to make them infallible in what they say or write. So infallibility applies only to those men whom God inspired to write down his very words. What that means is you're not infallible, neither am I. The Pope's not infallible, nor were the church fathers infallible in their writings. And St. Paul speaks to this actually um, already in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verses 10 through 13, he writes, According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. 
The foundation that Paul lays then in his teaching is the pure gospel. Uh, after Paul then, others will come along and will build upon that foundation. But he says later builders have to be careful as far as um, what they build upon that foundation. Uh, it could be gold, silver, and precious stones. And so those are good teachings and good practices and ceremonies which teach uh, the foundation of faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, wood, hay, and straw, or stubble in some translations, those are unworthy teachings and practices uh, which overthrow the foundation of the pure gospel, uh, which hide it, which obscure it. Uh, Philip Melanchthon speaks of this in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Uh, he writes, The writings of the Holy Fathers testify that sometimes even they built stubble upon the foundation, uh, but that th this did not overthrow their faith. Uh, that, that's a key to understand, is that these men can err, and at times did err in their teachings, just like any pastor can. Uh, Luther said something similar to this while lecturing uh, on 1 John. He said, because of the flesh uh, which we carry about, we can err. But in the spirit, we must see to it that we do not persist in error when it has been recognized. Therefore, the saintly fathers, who are also human beings themselves, must be read with discernment where they follow their own views. We know what we must follow. So I think understanding these two things makes the church fathers, makes reading the church fathers a whole lot easier. It's simply this, they could err, and at times they did, and so we read them accordingly uh, through the lens of Holy Scripture. Now, that being said, uh, I don't think that's what's happening here in Chrysostom. Uh, I'm not familiar with a passage where you uh, uh, say that he's uh, describing salvation almost in Roman Catholic terms. I've read many passages in Chrysostom uh, where he talks about justification by faith alone. So uh, I I'm not sure what you mean by that. But uh, I can address specifically uh, this stuff about uh, his sermon that's vexing you regarding the hardcore Christian life, as you call it. Uh, it's homily 11 on Romans 6, verses 5 through 18. And uh, that sermon speaks beautifully about uh, the grace that God gives in baptism. He says that baptism obliterates our former transgressions and that secures and it secures us against subsequent ones by removing us from the slavery of sin and teaching us instead to live as slaves of righteousness. Now, with that gospel in mind then, Chrysostom then goes on to inveigh against the love of money in his wealthy parishioners. And so he chides them saying this, the couches are mantled with silver on every side, while the bodies of the saints are deprived even of necessary clothing. So what he means is they were showing more attention to their furniture than to their brothers in Christ who were deprived of necessary things like clothing. Uh, they set senseless creatures uh, above their fellow men, like their horses, uh, you know, even to the point of inanimate objects like the furniture of their house. And so in doing so, they're showing that they are still serving the old master of sin, not the new master of righteousness. And so he employs that example then from the Christians in Acts chapter 4 to show his wealthy parishioners that this love of money is incompatible with the baptismal life and is in fact a symptom of spiritual death and decay. So the apostles then sold their houses and lands. Uh, you know, the rich of Antioch, uh, where Chrysostom preached then, they plunder houses and lands to enrich themselves while leaving their fellow man to waste away. And Chrysostom just simply says, this isn't the way that it should be for those who have been baptized into Christ and are no longer slaves to sin, like the sin of you know, the love of money. So uh, this is a very specific example used uh, to show the Christians in his parishes uh, that they should be repenting of this and instead not necessarily doing precisely what the apostles did but living according to the law of love. In fact, he ends his homily by exhorting them with these words. Wherefore, I beseech you, laying all this to heart, let us become sober-minded, late as it is, and become our own masters and transfer this adorning from outward things to our souls. So Christ, uh, Chrysostom's exhortation to his parishioners isn't an example of building on the foundation with wood, hay, or straw. This is an example of a preacher's preaching to his specific people uh, in a specific time against a specific vice. He's not saying to people, or you by extension, you know, you aren't Christians if you don't sell your, all your land and give alms. He's preaching against those who love their money uh, because that's how the Antiochians of his day were allowing sin to still rule in their mortal bodies. 
which instead they should have lived as servants of righteousness. So don't let things like this ruin your readings of the fathers, uh, but rather read them as faithful men who could and sometimes did err, while also then uh, at times building gold, silver, and precious stones upon the foundation of the gospel of Jesus. And, you know, if they sound harsh in their preaching, then perhaps the problem isn't with their speaking, but with our hearing. Thanks for the question. I love reading the Church Fathers. I love talking about the Church Fathers. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll see you next time on ATP.